<laughs> Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to the grand finale of Booktastic. What an amazing weekend. Thank you all so much for taking part. You've been an amazing audience. You've been so engaged and taking part and, and really got into this whole virtual festival that is a participatory festival. Um, it, it's, a, it's been a shame that we haven't been able to be doing this in person this year. Um, obviously, last year when we did our first live festival, we had no idea that we'd still be doing it virtually 12 months later. But here we are. And actually, because of this, it means we've been able to welcome so many more of you. Um, we, we don't just have families from Bedford with us, we have families from across Chile. We've got some families in Saudi Arabia and, and in different parts of Europe, which is wonderful. It's one of the, it's one of the, the, the good, the positives that's come out of all of this. Um, so next year we plan, fingers crossed, to be doing it um, in person, in the theatre, but we will be also um, live streaming so that anybody who can't get to Bedford but would like to take part will still be able to do it online. Um, and basically we want to keep this, this, this booktastic family that has grown so much in the last year, we want to keep it going. So we want to, we want to keep you with us. It's been an amazing weekend with 10 wonderful, different, diverse events, but some might say, we have left the best to last. We have Raymond Antrobus, who is an award-winning and best-selling poet. Holly Dunbar, who is an award-winning and best-selling author and illustrator. And together they have created something very, very special. Through Raymond's words and Polly's pictures, Can Bear's Ski tells a beautiful story that is full of heart. I know you're all gonna have a lot of questions, um, and you have the live Q&A button that you can pop them all into. And I'm going to keep looking at it throughout. I'll collect them all. And then at the end, I'm going to pass them over to Polly and Raymond, who I'm going to hand you over to you now because you, don't, you haven't come here to see me. You've come here to see them. So I would love you to welcome to Booktastic, Polly Dunbar and Raymond Antrobus. Hello. <laughs> hey, hello. Good to be here. Um, yeah. Wow. How are you, Polly? I'm good. I'm loving your sunshines. Is it is it sunny where you are? It is, it is actually. Yeah, the sun came out, and I had to put some of the sun on as well <laughs> for today for our session. Um, yeah, no, we really, yeah, great, great to be here. Um, uh, as has been said, my name is Raymond. Um, I'm a poet, um, but I think you know maybe the most important thing about me or one of the most important things about me is that I love stories. I love storytelling. I love writing. And I also love listening and hearing stories as well. Um, and then I had such an amazing opportunity to work with someone like Polly to bring a story to life, um, which is this book here, Can Bears Ski? And what I love is about this, this this picture, this cover, is that I often get questions about this cover. Like, oh, I wonder, I, I wonder for you what the first thing you notice about this cover is. Is it the bright colors? Is it the facial expressions? Is it the title, Can Bear Ski, this question? Is it our names? Or is it the thing that is in the bear's ears? I'm not sure. But one thing that um, everyone that's on screen now has in common probably is the thing in the bear's ears. So um, I wear two hearing aids. As I've gotten older, they've gotten smaller. So these are the smallest hearing aids I've ever had, um, you know, digital hearing aids. And so does Polly. Polly also wears hearing aids. Uh, two hearing aids in each ear. Um, and we can see the same is true of the bear. So um, we collaborated on this book and um, yeah, I don't know, Polly, do you want to say anything about, <laughs> about this, how, how this came to be? Yes, well, I, um, my mum is deaf and she is, she is also a writer. You met my mum before, before any of this happened, didn't we? Which is uh, sort of an amazing sequence of events. Um, and I think she said to you, you should write a picture book or a children's book. Did she say that to you? I think she yeah. said that to me anyway. Um, and she's like, you could do this. Um, you probably didn't want to at that point. <laughs> but she wasn't trying to 
push me forward for it. It's um, It just happened to be that the person who published, I've worked with for many years, who publishes my books, also is your editor. And um, she knows that I love to draw, as she said, well, children and animals and anything that's sort of got a lot of emotion in it, be it happy or sad or just the whole the whole range. And And your story has this, all of this, and it just so happened that I wear hearing aids too. And so I had an understanding of what it is like um, to be hard of hearing and what the, this, this character has gone through. Um, so for me, when I read the story, it's all just printed out on paper. They don't tell you how many pages it should be. It's just, it's just there, black and white on paper. And I was just absolutely blown away by it. It's got... Um, some of you might have read it, some of you might not, but it's it's got an amazing moment when we sort of figure out why it's talking about skiing with, with a boy with hearing aids in, which is sort of a little bit incongruous. And um, we'll find out why that yeah, is. But when I read it for the first time, it's like, brilliant. This is amazing. This is just, this is just what it's like. So, um, and I was, before we start, I was also so touched that it was... Um, it's written from the heart uh, and I think, you know, well, from personal experience, but from the heart. And so I try to draw the pictures from, from the heart too. And I hope that comes across. No, oh, shit. Uh, yeah. No, for sure. I think, um, yeah, let, let, let's, let's do the, let's the story. story do the talking. Yeah, sure. So hopefully you'll, you'll all agree. So here we go. From the first cover, Kambersky, we open up. First picture, we see snow. Dark Knight, Kambersky. Uh, yes. Okay. Here we go. All right. Dad Bear had a hard time waking me up in the morning. One, the radiator shakes. Two, the bed rumbles like a large empty tummy. Three, the, work, the windows by the bed tremble. Four, Dad Bear takes one heavy step forward. The ceiling cracks. Five, my eyes snap awake. I explode out of bed. My feet hit the ground. I'm up, I'm up. I put on sky blue socks and my orange trousers and yellow jumper. I like my colours loud. It's been snowing. Everything feels still. No rumbling, no trembling. It's like everything is breathing quietly. Then I feel Dad's voice. One, banisters shake. Two, pictures wobble. Three, stairs flinch. I'm coming, I'm coming, I say. See him come down the stairs there. There's a really nice detail of some of the pictures that were on the wall as well. You can talk about them. I gobble, gobble breakfast. Dad Bear has the TV on. I can see a man in a blue bodysuit skiing fast down a slope. Dad Bear is saying something to me. I think he says, can bear ski? I shrug. I'm not sure I heard him right. I eat the last of my porridge. Time for school. And you can see the man there on the TV screen skiing fast on the slope. Dad bear talks a lot on our way to school. I hear the crunch, crunch, crunch of the snow. Dad Bear stops and looks directly at me. Your friend was saying hello. Why did you ignore him? I didn't. I didn't. Then Dad Bear asks again, can bears ski? Is that really what he's asking me? Teacher Bear approaches Dad Bear. I can only hear little pieces of what they are saying. Have to sit front of class. Teacher Bear stamps on the ground. I feel the ground shake, so I look up. He is saying something to me, 
but I can't quite work it out. I wonder if it's Can Bear's Ski. David Bear sits next to me at lunch. He is talking a lot. Suddenly, laughter bursts out everywhere. I don't know what everyone is laughing at. He asked me a question. Can bears ski? I don't know. I wonder for you in this picture, can you, can you imagine the noise in that picture being around that table and everything that's happening? It's a very noisy picture. Spread that. Shh. Just to give some detail, the snowing outside. Boy Bear has his head in a book. Can you tell where he is? Can you tell he's in the library. He's deep in his reading. One day, Dad Bear picks me up early. We are going to meet someone with a name I can't say. She writes her name like this, audiologist. It's a really hard work to say. She puts headphones on my head. She wants me to put a block on the table every time I hear a sound. Then she show us something. Then she, then she shows us something called an audiogram. It's also a hard word to say. On the audiogram, my results are the shape of a ski slope. I imagine myself skiing down it. The audiologist asks, can bears ski? And I don't know if you've ever had a hearing test, but this is called a audiogram. And this shows you the results of your hearing test, how much, how much sound you can hear. And I remember me and Polly both had these done when, when we were having our hearing tests. And there's Boy Bear falling down his own graph. After a week and a few more tests, I start hearing therapy and lip reading classes too. The audiologist gives me plastic ears called hearing aids. They feel uncomfortable at first. Everything sounds like robots. The audiologist asks, can you hear me? Whoa, is life this loud? Picture. Sometimes I get tired and sound stops making sense, no matter how loud it is. Sometimes I take my hearing aids out and lose them. Yes, I'm not used to them yet. Oh, just look, having a look at this picture, I wonder if you can see where the hearing aids are and where Dad Bear's looking, and the expression on his face, I mean, the expression on Boy Bear's face as well. He's not quite sure about them. <laughs> yeah. Can bears ski? I still don't know how to answer the question. Dad Bear reads a story aloud. He looks directly at me. I can see his whole face and he speaks clearly. I can feel his big voice and see the words on the page. So I follow Dad Bear's finger. There is a big picture of the moon. I know what the moon is saying because I can see his whole face and the moon is speaking clearly. Can you hear me, says the moon. I say, bears can ski.
Yes. I've got my special sign. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, yeah, shall we? Um, well, I know that we're going to, are we going to do a draw along? Yes, shall yes. Um, yeah. Are you, have you got, have you got pens? Have you got paper? I've got, I've got a, a pen and I've got a felt tip as well this time. Oh, fantastic. You are well prepared. I hope the people watching are also uh, have something to hand, whatever you've got nearby. Um, I've got my uh, trusty paper here and I've got some of my thickest, brightest pens because um, Boy Bear likes his colours loud, which was a, um, it was wonderfully helpful for me actually, because I drew Boy Bear as the brightest, brightest character in the story. And that meant that on every page, he always shone out. He was always like the first person for first bear that you see, um, which was very helpful. Um, there were lots of other lovely things to draw in this in this book. Um, but the snow was such a clever thing to have snow because it's almost like a metaphor for how it is to be um, a little bit hard of hearing because everything can be a little bit muffled and a little bit quiet. Um, things like the dining room scene where you said Raymond you said can you imagine all the noises and I imagined all the all the laughing and the scraping and the cutlery and all those things that when you can't hear so well that's the one you can your ears sometimes pick up the noises that you don't want the background signs and not the ones you do want so it was so lovely to draw this because it's so crowded and they're all laughing and then you turn the page and there are no words just the shh sound and there are just the snow which sort of symbolizes silence and the books which are silent so there were some really really beautiful poetic words in here that gave me a lot of scope for for illustrating so um i think that page was my favorite favorite and i think it's more powerful because we've had this really really busy scene beforehand so you have that lovely contrast don't you and um he's quite happy there in his silence isn't he I think yeah, I, love this picture. I love this picture as well. And I also love that you've got these little drawings there on the wall. Oh, yes, yes. As you said before, when you went through it, all the little pictures I put in, they all have a little meaning. Um, the one, Raymond, that you pointed out of the one on the stairs, that was drawn by my son who was ill off school and I, I had to keep working. So he sat at my desk with me and he um, painted some bears and they were so much better than the bears that I'd been drawing that day that I thought these bears are going in the book. So I scanned them in and I made them small and I hung them on the wall. And then when you were little, was it right, Raymond, that you had a book that your dad used to read to you? Yes, that's right. Yeah, so um, there is a, uh, a book called Happy Birthday Moon, which I loved. And it was a book that my dad used to read to me, and he would just tell this story about a bear who. Had... <laughs> oh, it is yes, great, amazing, yes. So this bear, you can see the cover of this book, with this bear looking up into the night sky at the moon, and so the yeah, there you go. There's, there's a part of this book where um, it's, a, it's it happens to be the bear's birthday and he looks up at the moon and he says it's my birthday and the moon and the bear's voice echoes and everything he hears again because of because of the echo he thinks he's talking to the moon so the whole book is about this kind of friendship that this bear has with the moon and the talking back to and um yeah there's a there's a part in that in that book happy birthday moon where the moon is seen with a top hat yeah, so that's what I I made sure that I put a picture of that in the library because one of those other special things, you know, sometimes it feels like the sort of stars align and a book is meant to happen. Um, and when I went in to see the publisher, the people who make the books, mm. they got this out and they said this is was a great inspiration for Raymond. And I was like, I had that book as a child. <laughs> and I loved it too. And it's so, um, I don't think it's, you know, it's, it's quite a well-known book, but it's, quite unusual that we both had it it's not that well known is it um and we both had it and we were both inspired by it and i think a, you know a lot of the bright colors were an inspiration to me as well when when coming up with the design and thinking for this so yes 
lovely. <laughs> shall I shall I get these out? These yeah. out. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to teach you how to draw boy bear. Um, I this is the first time I've ever drawn bears for a book, which I've been making books for many many years. So it's quite unusual. But you'd think that I'd have done bears before because bears are quite popular in children's books. But I haven't. But I really think I'm just drawing children, but with um, with ears in different places. So anyway, to make him look young. Okay, start with the curve and then do his ears sort of on the side. Now I've left a little gap here and here. Now that's so we can pop his hearing aids in at the end. Now. When I was drawing the bears, I had to make the boy bear look young and quite cute and the dad bear look kind of big and old and gruff. So I gave boy bear an extra specially round face, um, whereas dad bear doesn't. And what was lovely in the class, I don't know whether you noticed, I was able to do lots of different kind of bears, like a panda bear and a polar bear. And um, it was lovely to get that variety in. So here we are, I've got his face. And now again, to make him look young, I make his body quite a lot smaller in comparison to his head. So we've got his little arms and if you make his tummy look a little bit round, um, there we go. And then his little legs, now make his legs look quite short. You can do a bend in the knee like that. And he puts on his, he does, has orange trousers, doesn't he? And I think it's, was it sky blue socks? I've got my sky blue nails, just especially for that. <laughs> so there we go. Little feet at the end. And, and then he doesn't have long fingers because he's a bear. So you could just give him short, short little paws like that. Now, normally, actually, that hand is way too big, isn't it? I hope your drawings are better than mine. <laughs> I'm sure Raymond's will be. So I normally actually start off with a facial expression, but I'm doing it last of all here for the, the grand finale. Uh, well, actually, it's not quite the grand finale. Do his nose quite high up, because again, that makes his, um, that makes his face look rounder, him look cuter, uh, happy happy smile I always do that line going down or one up or one up and you can either do your eyes open or closed or I like to do smiley eyes so they're like a smile but upside down so he looks really really happy doesn't he and then for the finishing touch which is very important to this book is if you choose a colour, if you've got different colours, if you haven't, don't worry about it. But there we go. He needs to have his hearing aids in, doesn't he? There we are. So it's really, really important that they're, they're nice and visible. So that's why I'm really glad that there were bears in this book as well, because it made them stand out. I'm just going to give him his signature bright, bright yellow. And have I got time to colour his shoes in? There we are. And another thing I really enjoyed doing about illustrating about Raymond's story was the um, ways of illustrating sound visually. Obviously, a book doesn't have sound coming out of it, so you have to do all those with mark making. So to make your bear look like his hearing aids have just been turned on, you can do these lovely spark spark lines. So that makes him look like he has turned his hearing aids on and he is listening to something pretty, pretty cool. There we go. I think I'm just about finished. I was also wondering, oh no, that's the wrong colour. I always put the wrong pen lids on my um, pens just to make it more exciting. <laughs> 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 As to what I'm going to get. There we go. I think he's finished. How did you get on, Raymond? Have you? Did you manage to? Um, yeah, I, I, this is... Um... This is how I've, where I've got to. <laughs> I got oh, my wide bear here, and I, I, I um, actually love drawing bears so much. I even have a friend for him here as well. So he's got two friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you do it in your spare time. <laughs> spare time, yeah, yeah, spare time, bear time. Oh dear, wonderful.
beautiful. That's so lovely to see. That's, I love the way that even though you do draw along and you all sort of draw the same lines, they each have such different character, don't they? They're all different. And I'm, I'm hoping some of you at home have drawn one and we will somehow be able to see them through magic of technology one day. But Rachel, you might be able to, to tell, us about, tell us about that. Actually, I think Rachel is around floating and she might have some questions to ask her. Can we summon her? Oh, Aha. the magic. <laughs> I didn't have colours, I'm afraid. I didn't have them to hand, but here's my bear. He can see him with his lovely hearing aid. But I, I need to colour him in later on, so uh, I'm going to go to my office and get some money. Um, that was so wonderful. I, just listening to you guys, kind of reading the story and sharing the process, it's, it's just, it gives you such an amazing visceral reaction lovely story and you can you can imagine how he was feeling before and then you can imagine how he felt afterwards and I think the bit that was really um the re bit that really touched me was when he was kind of losing his hearing aids and you can imagine what the world must have been like for him when it changed so dramatically and and I think it, it's just a gorgeous story I love it so much and clearly so does everybody else because we've got some incredible questions here so let me dig through them um Raymond, how much input did you give Polly on how the pages would look? Do you give her notes to go with the text? I did not, in all honesty. Um, I wrote the story, and I think my only requirement was that I would work with someone who, who would relate to the boy bear, who, who would understand what it is he is going through. I think that was my only um, request. And so, um, as Polly said, I'd met Joyce Dunbar, Polly's mother, who is also a, uh, a writer, a children's book illustrator. I was half expecting that to, you know, because it's the, it's the, it's the publisher that create the uh, collaboration, that bring, that bring the writer and the illustrators together. Um, so, no, I, I, there was no real, um... You did have a couple of really good points, though. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, because I, when I first did the roughs, because it's really nice when you get a story to not have notes to tell you how to illustrate it, because it lets, okay. you know, my imagination do the work. Mm -hmm. And it's hard if somebody else's imagination sort of steps in on the visual side. But once I did the roughs, you, you suggested, because I did the teacher was a lady oh yeah or just was a man That's there. Great. and you suggested swapping those over and that was such a brilliant suggestion and i think i'd gone with the sort of with the obvious um and so much better and little things like that you know they make they do make a difference don't they so yeah they, i think i think they do yeah absolutely um yeah that was important to me i wanted to if say anyone or who any of my teachers or audiologists who maybe you'd come across this book um, who you know haven't seen me since I was as as old as Boy Bear. Um, I really imagined them wherever they are out there um, picking up this book, maybe remembering my name and then recognizing themselves, you know, in this book. Saying, oh, I remember, I remember this whole situation, and I think I wanted. Yeah, I wanted that. <laughs> Were you taught by bears, right? I was taught by bears. That is actually <laughs> my secret. All of my teachers were bears <laughs> who wore jewellery as well. All of my doctors, too, were also bears. Some kind of jungle book story where you're... Uh... <laughs> yeah. So thank you for the question. I hope I answered it. No, no, that's, and actually that, that's brought me really nicely on to the next question, which was why did you decide to tell the story with bears instead of a child? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, as, yeah, exactly, as Polly said, yeah, that happy birthday moon and, and how that was a touchstone for us both, a, a, a book which had a presence in both of our childhoods, it seems. And this is the really powerful thing about reading, um, the more books you read, the more reference points or the more places you can go, the more other stories and other writers and other um, 
you know imaginary worlds you can bring in to your to to help you with your own imagining your own story so you know there's um something really for me uh powerful and emotional about the fact that we've been able to allow you know this this influence in of this but which which again I, not everyone has it, it, i didn't actually expect um holly to to know the book but the fact that she did and the fact that it, it, it came in in this way was just uh beautiful i love that it's incredible yeah. like you say it's not i mean clearly it's a it's it's a, a well-known book to a degree but i've never heard of it until i was reading interviews with both of you and, and heard about the fact that you and I, I i hadn't seen the book i didn't know of the book and so that's a real that's that's amazing yeah. and as it, as um raymond said everything you read filters in and i think the fact that we both had it as a child you know mm. the way you read things when you're little they really really go in you know because you read books over and over and over again don't you? and you really really look at the pictures and you engage with your whole imagination i mean I try to still now as a grown-up, but I think for me it was yeah, as you Raymond you put it, it's like part of the fabric of of your imagination. Um, you don't have to sort of think about it; it's just there, you know, in the background. So I wasn't looking at the book, going, "Oh, I'll like that color. I like that color." I just it was there already. So yeah, it's that. I mean, my favorite book from a child. It still evokes a very a very visceral response in me, which books as an adult perhaps don't. I love books that I've read as an adult. I've got lots of favourite books that I've read as an adult, but the one that's my favourite from childhood, I have a very strong response to it. It really evokes a lot of memories and makes me feel a certain way just thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you tell us about your hearing and some of your real life experiences that you drew on to create the story and to Polly for you to illustrate the story? Do you want to go first, Polly? Yep, yeah, yeah, you go. Polly, why don't you tell us your story first? Okay, um, well, when I didn't start losing my hearing until I was in my 20s, and I didn't get my first hearing aids until I was uh, in my 30s, so I went through a sort of 10 years of it going down and just sort of ignoring it. But my uh, it's hereditary in my family, which means it's passed on through the generation. So my mum is profoundly deaf, much more deaf than me. And my brother is more deaf than me. And he's older than me. But while I was at school, I, I witnessed him. He had hearing aids. He got they, his friends pulled them out, and bullied him. And that was very, very upsetting for me as a child because that's, you know, that's heartbreaking. And so he didn't wear hearing aids again. Um, so that picture in the dining room with him there looking so sort of forlorn and left out and the bears aren't bullying him mm. but it's that emotion that sort yeah. of feeling of feeling left out and the whole world is not you know you're not part of it that's very very hard my brother has since has hearing aids now since I got them and I was like they're fine they're cool <laughs> it's like it's not like putting something in your ears it's like taking something out because you know you're letting all the sound in it's like taking the plugs out and the sound's coming in and he's got them now and, and he's happy and and I think he um Raymond I think he cried when he read your book so um you know in a good way in a good way <laughs> um so yeah for me that sort of personal experience family experience not just my my deafness which has been in more recent years but you know growing up with it um I yeah that that means a lot to me and that's you know I try to put that in there mm over to you <laughs> yeah i know i think i think that um um i was born the year before it became mandatory to give newborn babies hearing tests um so before i was born a hearing test was considered just clicking in a child's ear and seeing if they respond uh that <laughs> Uh, clearly, I did something that made them that convinced people that I was hearing, uh, but I but I wasn't, and it wasn't picked up until I was around six years old. Um, and it was actually a telephone that diagnosed me. My mother just got this new telephone, and everyone was talking about how they could hear the telephone in whatever room of the house they were in, and I could never hear it. And so, I, there was a, a point when she was just watching the telephone ring. And then she was looking at me, not responded, and she said, I think we need to check his hearing. And so 
I wasn't doing well academically at school. It was assumed already that I had uh, dyslexia and all of these learning difficulties. Um, but then once they figured out it was my hearing, I was given hearing aids and hearing therapy, a lot like the uh, boy bear is in the book. You know, I was very privileged to get so much support. And all of this was free, like on the NHS as well. Um, and having um, in-class support, having someone coming into my classes and just helping me write notes and making sure I could hear um, the instructions of the teachers. And this is something which only as an adult have I and, and gone around the world and, and met deaf people all over the world, Ukraine and Jamaica and Antigua and America, all over the world. Do I really see how... Um, there aren't many places that where deaf people are given the kind of access that I had. Um, and so every time I tell this story, I think about that. Think about the people, that, uh, particularly the deaf and hard of hearing people who aren't supported, who don't have, get an opportunity to feel cared for or seen or looked after. And I was hoping that a book like this would begin to remedy maybe some of the things that have been difficult for them. But ultimately this is a story that isn't about trauma, and it's not about my trauma. It is a it's, it's a story, you know. Um, so I hope that anyone can find a way into this book. Um, and I've been getting lots of really great messages, actually, not just from young readers, but from old readers as well. People who, like Polly, had got hearing aids later on in their life, and then they had to kind of explain their deafness to sometimes some of their adult children as well as their young children and they said that this book has helped them do that and that that's really moving and important to me i think that's that's one of the things that i love i mean it's one of the things that i've always tried to do with the bookshop is have have books for children that illuminate that tell the story that's outside of this kind of almost mainstream to try and help so kambersky is a great book because it lets children who are deaf or hard of hearing be seen but I think for me, the val one of the real values is like um, Freddie and the Fairy that Julia Donaldson wrote. It's about giving hearing children an understanding of the experience of deaf or hard of hearing children. Yeah. And it's about opening that experience up, helping people to understand what the experience feels like and making that connection that, I mean, one of the things I work with a, an amazing, I have worked and worked with an amazing charity in Bedford called Access Bedford and that um, lack of um, connection to language is such a huge thing that I don't think people, it doesn't even, it's not even on their radar if it's not something that you've been affected by. And, and when you write books like this for children, you put it on their radar from a young age and you make it something they think about, which perhaps they wouldn't normally. And I just think it's so powerful to do that. And this book is, it's, I, I, it's, it's an amazing story, both for deaf and hard of hearing families and for hearing families. So it's really powerful. I think it's amazing. Thank you. Um, Raymond, you you are a, <laughs> I mean, to say you are a very successful poet is kind of underplaying it a little bit. You've done and you you you've, you've awards and fellowships and all over the world you're a member of Literary Pen. I mean, you've done so much in the adult realm. What made you decide to do a picture book and enter the children's sphere? <laughs> Honestly, that was uh, an accident. Um, I did a reading about five years ago now, four, five, four years ago, at, um, at a, in Bradford, Bradford Literature Festival. And I was reading with um, two huge poets, one of them, uh, Jackie Kay, um, the former Macca of Scotland, and, and that just all round beautiful poet and person, um, and the former poet lawyer of Jamaica, Lorna Goodison. Um, which was just kind of like a, a dream kind of reading to be part of. Um, but it was the first time I'd read, um, or one of the first times I'd read from a book which I, which I was still trying to write, a book of poems called The Perseverance. And in that book, the last poem I read in that from the book on that night was called Happy Birthday Moon, and in a, a kind of homage to, yeah, to that. Um, my dad had passed away quite recently at that point. So, and that was a poem I wrote because it was my dad who read me that book. And so even now, you know, talking about the memories you have of a book, you've, you know, I can't disassociate my memory 
of my childhood from and, and my dad like from that so every time i see you know happy birthday moon it is like a moment for me it's oh yeah <laughs> you know um so i'd read this book and afterwards a person who works in children's publishing called maria who probably knows just came up to me and said hi really enjoyed your reading have you ever considered working uh, writing for children and honestly initially my response was um no thank you so much not for me goodbye um and then about a week or two later i ended up um as a poet in residence at, at my former school which is a deaf school in uh, north london and something i do whatever school i'm going into i always look into their library um and so i'm looking at the library in the school and i don't see any books that represent deaf or hard of hearing characters in a deaf school it made no sense to me um so straight away i got back in contact with the children's publisher and said you know what i want to give this a go uh, as and i spoke to uh, joyce dunbar polly's mother about you know do you think this would be a, a good idea you'd, you'd also mention because i'd also met um choice around that same time so all of these kind of stars were aligning it's talking about the the planets um and it felt like the universe was pushing me towards making it making it happen so um initially this story was actually i tried to write it as a as a poem for a book which just never worked it didn't work and so i decided to just write out the story kind of you know, thinking about the sound of the story, sure, but I got rid of any kind of poetic form. It was a very loosely told, loosely, loose, loosely musical story. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and, and, it, and it kind of just happened that way, you know, quite an organic way. So what is, or is there anything, or what is the most important thing, and this is from Alison, mm. you would want to tell parents of deaf children from your experiences? I think for me, um, I mean, there are many things. I think the, the most important thing, one of them is that deafness is not a trauma, meaning deafness is not a tragedy. Um, deafness is an experience, but also it's, um, I want to say, yeah, no, I think, I think, yeah, you, you said only one thing. So I guess that's, that's the main thing. Yes, it's, it's, it's an experience, not a tragedy. What about you, Polly? What would I say to par parents? Um, yeah, I think similar to what Raymond says, it's, it doesn't need to hold you back. And in fact, it can, it can push you forward in strange kinds of ways, you know, our, um, how you know sometimes you lose this one sense and other senses become more alert you know you can people who learn to speak with their hands i mean i don't sign but how beautiful is that i mean what an amazing way to communicate um my mum has um started going deaf since she was five um somebody once said to her so she can't maybe you haven't got very good outer ears but you've got very good inner ear for as being an author That's amazing. isn't that lovely and so i was sort of brought up with this feeling that being becoming deaf isn't as james said a tragedy and my mum was actually more upset about me becoming mm. deaf than herself mm. and she did feel like it was a tragedy but mm. i was like but mum you're fine so i'll be fine <laughs> you know and i was lucky to have that i was lucky to have that um sort of normality but yeah i guess to not panic i mean i think in the in the book where the dad bear i've tried to show that the emotions of the dad bear are, are as important as the emotions of the boy bear the mm. body language he's yeah. you know he doesn't want to hear this news about his son you know not being absolutely sort of normal or or as he would assume to be or anything wrong with him you know it's not about anything being wrong with you it's about understanding you know and it's about as you say talking clearly with your whole face and and that's dad has gone on that journey mm. with the boy and he has an understanding of it so yeah i guess um i think that that line about i could see his whole face you know that that's yeah. it isn't it that's so beautiful and that is it you know you, you just have to 
you have to speak to your children so they can hear you. <laughs> well, it's like, I, mean, I think any, any, well, once you become a parent, you realise how much your actions in such subtle ways influence the way your child responds to something. And, you know, um, my daughter, who's 13, she's kind of grown up being kind of peripherally involved with Access Bedford and things like that. One of the things she loves to do, and she keeps asking me to send them through to to my friends at Access Bedford to see if she's doing it right, is she likes to do little videos of herself and she learns the BSL for um, various pop songs. And so while she's listening to a pop song, she will video herself doing the British Sign Language. And the way that she uses her face and her hands to talk instead of using her voice, it's like, it's like dance or it's like, it's such a wonderful way of communicating without you know, and that's like that's that's something that you get that you you get as an almost a positive as a side effect of like you're saying, you know, your your other senses are enhanced. And that the beauty in British Sign Language, I think, is 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 incredible. It's very powerful. Yeah, I mean I think I think one thing I want to say to that is that that's just the beauty of language in general. I think la I see language as technology, and we all have it, you know. So so the thing that I think Polly has done, which I think is just, it just amazing. The first time I saw her illustrations of this book, I cried. I couldn't believe because again, she managed to carry the story through the face, through the body. You know, everything that's in between the words is there. Um, and I think, I think that could have only been a, a, a accomplished by um, someone who had Polly's talent, but also Polly's experience. And that understanding. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, I, I think it's, I, I, I genuinely, I think it's a, a hugely powerful book. Um, are you planning on doing any more for children, Raymond, or is that your one? <laughs> I, <laughs> no, I have actually written another one and it will be out next year, I think. Um, and I'm also very proud of it, but it's quite, it's quite different to this book um and yeah i don't i mean I don't, I don't know how much i can say about it at this point but yes there will be another one at some point <laughs> excellent polly what are you doing next um what am i doing i am um, lots i'm not oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> what am i doing i'm doing something now the one yes. that you're sharing at the moment the, I, um... have, I have just done a book um about hedgehog and tortoise and there's um i've been doing a lot of those books written um by Irma McLaughlin, and that's been a lot to do with the sort of current situation of the pandemic and stuff. So that's been that's been lovely to do. I'm working on a book at the moment, which is a book of poetry, not written by me, um, for very young children. I can't say too much about it. Um, I think at the moment, so I can't reveal who it's written by. <gasps> but um, it's great. It's great fun. Oh, I mean, there are some. I think, thankfully. Uh, looking at what what is out there I, I but certainly when I was in the shop there are there are more and more books coming out I think there's a great one called song for a whale which is a book for older children about deafness and Ross Montgomery brought one out called Max and the Millions which is kind of a not a picture book but not quite as old as song for a whale and the thing I love about those again is that the they're not they're not a book about deafness they are beautiful stories that have a deaf character in the center of it and I think that you guys have got such an amazing kind of knowledge and understanding of that that I would love to see more more of that coming out um I must say in this book that I'm doing with that was written by um another poet um sorry Raymond <laughs> I have there was a boy wearing hearing aids in there he's, I know, he's wearing hearing aids I've, I've just put them in incidentally and um I think having done this I'm like right yeah actually it's just pop them in they're just there one child's wearing glasses the other way is hearing aids um and i think i yeah i wouldn't have thought to do that before but now it's like just just have it as part of just normal normality it's about yeah i think what a lot of what we try to do when we're programming the festival is to try and bring you know i was talking to uh, zainab about um the planet omar books and I said, this is what we want. We don't, we, we want a book that is funny and silly and interesting. And oh, actually, incidentally, in the middle of it, they talk about, you know, being Muslim and doing prayers. Uh, but it's not, it's not a book about that. These characters are just. Absolutely. And I think with Canvas here, I've said it to Raymond a hundred times. What, the reason I wanted to illustrate it was not because it was about a, a deaf child. It's because it's full of magic. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, 
and that's that, in the library is oh god it's yeah cool. i mean that is what holds the book together that's what makes it re readable and that's what makes it connect with the children's heart is the magic yeah. so the to sew those important things yeah. together that's it it's a beautiful it. story about relationships you know the relationship with the bear to, the little bear to his dad and to his friends it, it's this it's it, it's obviously a, a book about a bear understanding that he has a journey to go on with his hearing but there is that's not you know there's so much more happening around yeah. it i mean there's a moon and the moon oh. sort of talks and speaks and and understands and and that's um yeah, yeah that's that's beautiful yeah absolutely oh god thank you both so much we've gone quite a way over but i couldn't stop listening to you is there anyone still listening <laughs> <laughs> everybody is still here believe me they are <laughs> listening in it's 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 been amazing and thank you so so much for joining us it's been it's been wonderful um, and i'm sure you're all very very keen to read kambeski and we sent you a link um, when we sent out the the connection to today's event so if you click on that link you can buy um the book um wow we're at day three the festival we're well over done. Done. <laughs> it's official it is <laughs> i'm gonna hold my bear up too um thank you so much to, to you raymond and to you polly and to everybody who is here at our grand finale for making this festival so amazing that the people who are watching and engaging and asking the questions and participating are what makes it so special and so perfect we're making plans for 2022 so we'd love to hear from you all and find us on social media show us your pictures that you did today and um, tell us your favorite bits tell us who you'd like to see next year because we want to hear this is your festival and we want to know who you want to see and and who you want to invite along thank you both raymond and polly thank you to everybody else and thank you for an amazing festival it's been wonderful thanks a lot thank you thank you bye